By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back at the Raging Bull series. We have reached the semi-finals and in the semi-finals we have Kun Haak who's playing a dead guy ill on steroids deck. It is super good. It's got Jews and Jins. It's got blue power. It's dangerous. And he is taking on Thomas Nilsson and he's playing with a Chains of Mistopheles deck. Now that is something different, right? He's doing really well with this deck here at this tournament and he's been doing so at other tournaments as well, so I've been told. So I'm looking forward to kind of dissect his deck with you. Now before I jump into the deck deck section of this deck and I'm going to try to explain to you how Chains of Mistopheles works, I hope that I understand. Um, anyway, so I'm going to do that in the deck tech section, but before I do so, I would first like to point out that, as always, you can also choose to skip this section, go straight to the games instead. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of them reads MTG Games. Click on there. It'll take you straight to the action, and in that same description below, you will also find a really sweet, nice little link tucked away that links to my Patreon page. That is patreon.com slash timmytalks. Please take a moment to check it out, because by becoming a patron of the show, you are supporting Timmy Talks financially, and you are helping me to continue making content for you guys. It already starts with $1 a month, so please take a moment to check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. Okay, now that that is out of the way, we are going to start with the deck decks. I'm going to start with the deck of Kuhn. And here we see the deck of Kuhn. So it's called Dead Guy Ale on steroids. Now, Dead Guy Ale refers to playing with a black and a white deck. So a combination of those two colors. And the steroids part refers to the three power cards and the brain geyser. And in this uh, case, there's a new steroid in town, which is Wheel of Fortune. So first check out those power cards. Ancestral Recall, Time Walk, Time Twister. I mean, those cards are splashed in a lot of decks for a simple reason. They're super good and make most decks even better, right? I mean, an Ancestral Recall, Time Walk, what deck wouldn't want to play those? And they're easy to splash because they only have one blue in their casting cost. Same thing goes for Time Twister. Uh, Brain Geyser, a little bit harder, right? The Sorcery, two blue and X, but of course it allows you to draw cards. The, the card is simply so good. And what I like about Brain Geyser in this deck is that you can also use it as a finisher to kill your opponent. You can make something that's called the Blue Fireball because you're also playing with Underworld Dreams. So Underworld Dreams and Enchantment for three black from Legends that says every time your opponent draws a card, he or she takes a damage. So with your Brain Geyser, you can force your opponent to draw cards and they take a damage every time they do so. So, I mean, when he's low enough, of course, in most situations, you're just gonna use the Brain Geyser for yourself, but I just wanted to, you know, to let you know this, that it could be a way to finish an opponent off and I find it a really classy and fun way to do so. Um, talking about taking damage from the Underworld Dreams, he is also playing with one red card and that is the Wheel of Fortune. I think it's a very good decision to play it in this deck because he's got the Black Lotus, he's got the Mox Ruby, he's got four City of Brasses. So, I mean, he, he can get he can get to the red mana, I think, with this. And it's just really good because, you know, uh, Wheel of Fortune, discard your hand, draw seven new cards, your opponent does the same thing. That means that if you've got one Underworld Dreams on the table, your opponent takes seven damage because you're going to draw seven new cards. If you have two Underworld Dreams on the table, you take 14 damage, right? So Wheel of Fortune in a deck with Underworld Dreams is just really good. And remember, he's also playing with Demonic Tutor, so he's got two chances of finding that card right out of his deck. So that's really good. And then of course you still have Time Twister as well. You've got the Brain Geyser. So, I mean, this is just, just really, really good. Now, besides these cards, the base of the deck is very solid, right? He's got a lot of uh, answers to problems. He's got Disenchant, he's got Storch to Plowshares, he's got Balance, he's got, uh, of course, the Sinkholes as well, you know, to deal with those special lands. So he's got a lot of answers and he's got a lot of threats. Check out that creature base four Juzam Jins, five, five powerhouse for four mana. What's not to love, man? This is dangerous. A lot of people, they keep saying that, you know, sitting in a bottle is too good of a card. And I, I agree. I think it could have designed better. I think we all agree upon that. But on the other hand, we keep seeing these powerful Arabian Nights creatures finding their way into the top of tournaments, right? Serenity Befreed and also the Juzam Jin. There are a lot of Juzam Jin decks at this tournament, which I love because I love the card. Uh, but on one side, it also surprises me because Maze is unbanned, City in the Bottle is a thing now. So, But it turns out it's just such a good card, you still play it. And of course, it's a love for this card as well. I'm sure that contributes also. Anyway, a very strong deck, Dead Guy Ill on steroids, a super deck. Now let's take a look at the deck of the opponent. 
Okay, and here we see the deck of Thomas Nilsson. So this deck is completely built around Chains of Mistopheles. So maybe it's a good, you know, starting point to look at this card and discuss what it actually does, right? So this is a card from Legends. One black and one, an enchantment. So not an enchant world, an enchantment that reads, if a player would draw a card except the first one they draw in each of their draw steps, that player discards a card instead. If the player discards a card this way, they draw a card. If the player doesn't discard a card this way, they mill a card, right? Now, uh, this is super confusing. So when you Google this card, you get a lot of really nice flow charts. So this is one of those flow charts, and that really helps me to understand this card, right? So a player is about to draw a card. Is it the first card the player draws in his or her draw step? If the answer is yes, you just draw the card. Nothing happens. If the answer is no, it gets a little bit more complicated. Then a player needs to discard a card. Did the player discard a card? Yes. Then you can draw a card. If the answer is no, then the player puts the top card of his or her library into the graveyard. So basically what this card does is if you combine it with cards like Winds of Chains, uh, Wheel of Fortune, Time Twister, you know, cards that let you discard your hand and draw new cards, you basically end up with just one card in hand. You can only keep that one card in hand. You constantly have to discard your cards, right? So you end up with just one card in hand. Why is that important for this deck? Because this deck wants to win with the wreck. So the wreck is an artifact from antiquities that reads, as the wreck enters the battlefield, choose an opponent, right? Okay, so you choose. Then at the beginning of the chosen's player upkeep, the wreck deals X damage to that player where X is three minus the number of cards in their hand. Right? So if you have two cards in your hand, you take one damage. If you have one card in your hand, you take two damage. If you have zero cards in your hand, you take three damage. If you have three cards or more in your hand, you take no damage. So if your opponent, in this case Thomas, wants to win with the wreck, the goal of the deck is to make sure that you go to you know zero cards in hand or one card in hand, at least less than three, or else you don't take any damage. So that whole deck you know, works towards that moment. Now, Besides that, there are also some other cards in the deck, right? He is playing with four Suchi, for example, you know, which is really good. It's a four, 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 four. He's playing with three copy artifacts. He's playing with two surrender Perfrites. So he's got some creatures in here as well. He also has some direct damage in the deck, you know, Psionic Blast, Lightning Bolt, you know, so he, he, he can do some things. What I also find really interesting in this deck is that he's playing with two Hercules Recall. I find it really interesting. I wonder how he's going to use those. So that's that's quite interesting. Then um, in the sideboard we see two abyss. I guess when he for when he plays against a creature heavy deck, actually that card would be really good or is really good in the in the matchup today. Uh, we also see terror. I don't think terrors are coming in. We see some more lightning bolts. So there are some you know some interesting cards. We also see two Shivan dragons in the sideboard. Do you see that there in the left bottom corner? Now that is very stylish, Mr. Thomas Nielsen. Please let me know when you've used those and if you're going to board them in against uh, Kuhn here. I don't think you will, but if you will, that would be an, a pleasant sight. I just love creatures like a Shivan Dragon. Anyway, this is the deck of Thomas Nielsen. I hope I was able to kind of explain to you what he wants to do. Let me know in the comments below if you have any more questions about this deck and I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. Now, we've also uh, looked at Kuhn's deck, so that means we, we are ready. Let's go to the semifinals! of the Raging Bull series. Game number one here of the semi-finals. On the right side, we have Kuhn, who is playing his Dead Guy Ill on steroids deck. So it's black, white, and blue. It's got four Jews and Jins. It's got all the blue power. And on the opposite of Kuhn, his opponent is Thomas Nilsson. He is playing a Chains of Mistopheles deck today. It's black, it's red, and it also has blue in there. And uh, both players starting here with a Mox Sapphire. And here we see Thomas copying the Sapphire of Kuhn. So a very explosive start here for both players. That copy artifact is quite nice. Ramping up here early. Remember, he's also playing with four Suchis, Thomas. So maybe next turn he can play a Suchi. Here we see a Strip Mine, though. Is he going to use the Strip to try to slow Thomas down? Yes, he is. Taking care of the Badlands. And passing the turn, look at that. And it's been going really well for Thomas here, finding that Ancestral Recall, refilling his hand. The hand was looking kind of empty after that Mox Sapphire uh, opener with the Copy Artifact. Now it's going to draw another card for turn. So that hand's full again. Let's see what he can do. There's another Badlands in hand. Looks like he's going to play that one out. Three mana now. Four mana with the Mox Emerald. Is he going to cast a Suchi? Ooh, there's even a Sol Ring, lots of mana, and there is the Suchi. 
Are we going to see a counter spell? No, we're not just a pass. Now remember, Kuna, of course, is playing with white. So he's got swords, he's got disenchants. He just doesn't have a white source yet. Which is a bit of a problem, it seems here. Kuna now does have three mana. He could play out a Hypnotic Spectre. There's a sinkhole, so really trying to attack those lands. The problem here, of course, for Kuhn is that uh, Thomas drew so much ramp there in the form of the Moxes and the Sol Ring. And I believe he's got another bad lance in hand. He can attack now for four. Exactly, putting Kuhn on 16. There's a Mishra's Factory, so he can attack for six next turn. That would put Kuhn on 10, so it's really time for him now to play something out. If he can find a land, he can perhaps play a land, tap, and uh, play a Juzam. There is Hypnotic Spectre. I mean, that's good, but it's not great. Oh, and now it's just bad. There's this Psionic Blast. At least it's not 4 damage to the Dome. You know, that's something. So Kuhn on 16, Thomas on 18. I'm expecting an attack for 6 here. Just an attack for four. No, an attack for six. Yeah, he's gonna attack for six. So Kuhn dropping to ten. Four mana still for Thomas there open. Remember, the copy artifact is a mock sapphire. There we see a bad lance and a pass. So at least the good news for Kuhn here is that things didn't get worse. If he can just find a land, preferably a white one, you know, he can draw into his answers, disenchant swords, and he can kind of get control back. Only two cards in hand for Thomas, by the way, and five cards in hand for Kuhn. Tapping two here. What is he going to do? Demonic Tutor, perhaps? Yeah, Demonic Tutor. Maybe he's going to go for the White Land. You know, you got to do what you got to do. I mean, it's hard to make predictions here because we simply do not know the other four cards in the hand of Kuhn. Now, Kuhn is on 10. I mean, a balance here wouldn't really help him that much because he would have to discard and of course uh, Thomas would only lose to Suchi so that doesn't seem to be a good choice he could go of course for the Ancestral Recall and hope that in those three new cards he can find an answer but maybe a white source makes sense but that depends on the other cards in his hand of course like if he's got a disenchant and the swords in hand you know then perhaps looking up uh, a tundra might be a solution And just, I mean, just the Juzam would be great as well because, you know, you can block everything. The downside, of course, of that is that, you know, the Juzam does hurt you one during your upkeep and you're already on 10. Ancestral Recall. Okay, so I guess he looked up the Recall just hoping to find something. So three new cards here. So now he's got six in hand, it seems, or seven even, passing the turn. Not finding any lands then, by the way, because he missed his land drop here. There's a Winds of Change. So this is actually... I'm surprised by this move, to be honest. I mean, I find this a risk by Thomas. The reason I'm saying that is that Kuhn missed his land drop, so he didn't find any lands. He still doesn't have a white source, you know, and, and he, Kuhn needs white mana to take care of the, of the creature threats on the battlefield. And, and now he's kind of giving Kuhn a chance to draw into so many new cards with this Winds of Change. And... Thomas only had three uh, cards in hand, I believe, including the Winds of Change, so he can only draw two new cards. So maybe he just, like, gave Kuhn a fighting chance to get back into this. And that's, of course, not what you want to do. I mean, look at that. Seven cards here for Kuhn. And the way he's shuffling, you can see he's eager. And the way he puts those cards down, he's happy with this decision by Thomas. There's an attack for six, and I guess if you're Thomas, you're hoping to find a Psionic Blast. There's the Blast, winning it here without even using a single chains in this game. So hopefully we get to see that in game number two. But wow, what an ending here by uh, by Thomas Nilsson. Making that play with the Winds of Change. I thought it was the wrong decision, but who am I? Thomas winning here thanks to that play because that made him find the uh, psionic blast well done so the, both of these players are uh, going to dive into their sideboards and we are going to catch back up with them in game number two game number two here we go so it's kun on the play starting with the scrubland and again that mock sapphire so now kun has white mana then i already think we're going to see a completely different game white has all the answers right here we see the badlands and then the pass by thomas 
Let's see if maybe Kuhn can find a Swamp and play out an Hypnotic Spectre, playing a full playset in his deck. It's also going to be interesting to see what cards are coming in from the sideboards. There's another Scrubland and a pass. So no pressure yet. Can Thomas here find the chains? That would be quite cool. Remember, it's only one black and one to cast. And there it is, Chains of Mephistopheles. I love it, I love it, I love it. So now we're gonna see it in action. And uh, I really wonder if, you know, if Thomas also has like a Winds of Chains in hand, for example. That would be really sweet. So now Kuhn, of course, you can see him kind of, maybe he's asking about, okay, how does this card work again? Anyway, there's the pass. And just like when you draw your first card of the turn, nothing happens. We can see that here. The fun starts if you draw your second, third, etc. card. Anyway, Kuhn tapping four. There's a Juzam Jin. Didn't see a single Juzam in game one. And now here it is, 5-5 five, five Powerhouse. I mean, this thing is huge. And the question is, can Thomas, you know, do his thing before he's dead, basically? Needs to find a solution. Doesn't really have great answers to this creature because he's playing with Lightning Bolt and Psionic Blast. And both of those spells are not, don't deal enough damage to take care of the uh, creature with the five toughness. So that's tough. Tapping two here. What are we going to see? Okay, there's a copy artifact copying the Mox Sapphire passing the turn. So that's not really a lot. So I'm sure if you're Kun, you're kind of happy with this turn by Thomas. Taking a damage from his Juzam, going to 19. Now he can swing in for five. And you can put Thomas on 15. Just take away a quarter of his life. There's a Batlance. Five mana open. Let's see what he's going to do. I mean, he's going to swing in, right? He's going to play something out first. There's a Disenchant. Interesting. Disenchanting here, this copy artifact, and not the Chains of Mephistopheles. Interesting. I mean, if I would see that card, I would actually disenchant the chains, thinking, okay, he wants to do something with it, I'm going to kill it. But I guess, I mean, maybe if you're Kun, you're thinking, you know, I don't want him to have four lands, because then he can start playing out the Suchis again, or maybe some other threats. And it seems it works, though, because look, Thomas doing nothing, only passing the turn. So it looks like he's not really finding anything. Now here we see a sinkhole. Exactly. Keep attacking the mana base, right? Going to take care of the City of Brass, attacking for five. Look at the life total of Thomas. It's halved. He's on ten. Maybe we're in for a very short game number two. There's a copy artifact, copying the Sapphire again. So he really wants to get to four mana, it seems. Again, a disenchant. Yeah, now Kuhn kind of knows. Okay, if you want it so bad, I'm going to make it really, really difficult for you. I really wonder what that hand of Thomas looks like. Anyway, he's going to go down to five, only one more turn. Wow, a factory making matters even worse. Is Thomas simply going to die to this one Juzem Jin? Is that what's going to happen here in game number two? At least play out a Winds of Change to show us how your cart works. Oh man, it's not happening though, the past turn already. Ooh, Word of Command, that is so cool. We haven't talked about Word of Command at all, by the way. I kind of missed that card, I guess, in the deck deck. So Word of Command means he gets to see the hand of... Uh, he gets to see the hand of Kun, and he gets to play a card out of it. So he kind of takes over Kun's hand for a moment until the spell that he's played out resolves. I mean, Word of Command is so cool. I mean, the art of Word of Command... Uh, I've mentioned it here on the channel a few times, so sorry if I'm repeating myself, but the art of Word of Command made by Jesper Mirfors was never meant to be on a magic card. So now he's looking at the hand of Kuhn and he's deciding to play out the balance. And that means, of course, that it takes care of the Juzam Jin. So that's going to die. And of course, Kuhn's going to lose a lot of lands. It also means, though, that Thomas has to discard a couple of cards, though. So now we finally get to see what he had in his hand. Well, let's see. Wheel of Fortune, Time Twister, Chains, and a Suchi. Wow, so he had those draw sevens. And now the balance is also resolving, right? Well, it already was because Thomas was discarding cards from his hand. But now Kuhn has to make the decision. Juzam's gone. What lands does he want to keep? Of course he wants to keep the man land, the Mishra's factory. He can still attack here for two. So now the word of command has been resolved. So now we can get on with our lives. 
There's a land being played out for Kun, and he can attack for two, of course. Tom is going to three. But how cool it is that we see word of command in action. I can't believe I missed that in the deck deck. Anyway, oh, okay, so here's the rack. So now we now we kind of see the deck of, of Thomas kind of doing his thing in a very modest way, but still. So Kun taking a little bit of damage here with only one card in hand, drawing card number two here. He can just animate attack again and probably going to put him on one. No, he's not. There's the bolt. So Thomas is still fighting this. Drawing a card for turn. I wonder what he wants to find here. Ooh, it's a land. Probably not what he was looking for. So more damage here from the rack. It's nice to see the rack in action. But now Kuhn, of course, having three cards. So the rack no longer works. I really hope that Thomas can find a Winds of Chains to kind of, you know, show the uh, change of Mephistopheles in action. Anyway, there's a Suchi from him, which is not too bad. I mean, Kuhn is now on 13, so if he can, you know, attack next turn, you know, put him on 9. Kuhn taking a damage, going to go to 12. I wonder what he's going to do. Going back up, changing his mind. Playing a Mox Jet instead. Tapping 3. Okay, Hypnotic Spectre. That is really good. Also because Thomas has no cards in hand. He's in top decking mode and he's on 3. Attack for 4. Going to put Kuhn here on 9. And another rack. Ooh, that's actually quite good because it's going to take 2 damage. He's got 2 cards in hand. But now there's going to be the attack by the Hippie. And he's going to drop down to 1. So it's almost over. Kuhn also has, I believe, some Psionic Blast in his deck. Or not. No, I don't think so, actually. Anyway, let's let's see what, what's going to happen. There's the attack for four. So Kuhn actually dropping all the way to three. Look how close Thomas is getting. You know, and he was going nowhere in this game, but still he put Kuhn on three, and it looks like now he's going to lose, though. Yeah, <laughs> funny move with the Sapphire. So Thomas losing game number two, but he got really, really close. And I'm actually quite happy because we got to see the chains in action. We got to see the Juzam Jin hitting the table, which is a beautiful creature. And it is now 1-1. And that means we are going to go to game number three. Game number three. Here we go. The big decider. Who's going to make it to the finals of the Raging Bull series? Will it be Thomas Nilsson or will it be Kuhn Haak? That's the big question. Thomas starting here. With an underground C passing the turn. Look at that opener there. Scrubland and a Mox Ruby pass turn. Let's see what these players can do. Looks like there's a Mishra's Factory in hand for Thomas. He's thinking about it. And I really wonder if we're going to see his uh, chains of Mephistopheles hitting the board again. If we're going to finally see the chains really working, doing what it wants to do in combination with the rack and, for example, the Winds of Change. We'll just have to wait and see. There's a copy artifact, again copying the mocks. I mean, this is something that Thomas is doing non-stop, right? Those copy artifacts are really in there to copy the mocks, and that's quite interesting to see. Talking about mocks, and there's a mocks pearl tapping for Juzam is back. Remember, Juzam in game two really wrecked havoc, almost single-handedly killed Thomas Nilsson. And now in game number, two, uh, number three, it's also back. I mean, uh, this is a thriller scenario here for Thomas Nilsson. Just play a Mace. If you have it, I don't think he does though, but if you have, this is why, you know, I like Mace of If. It's great against these type of creatures. City in a bottle could be another consideration for Thomas Nilsson to add to his sideboard, by the way. But anyway, let's not talk about cards that he doesn't have. Let's see what he can do against this uh, monster playing another Underground Sea. Beautiful cards again here at the uh, Raging Bull series. It's really insane. He's going to tap here the copied Mox Ruby to animate. He's going to attack. Interesting. Or is he going to copy? Going to tap both. I think he's going to copy. Okay, so he's going to copy the factory. He's going to tap two more. Going to play a time walk. Okay, I'm liking this. That is really nice. So the interesting thing is how Copy Artifact works with Mishra's Factories. You've got to animate the factory, then you play your Copy Artifact. And, um, okay, let's see what happens. Yeah, untapping. Then you play the Copy Artifact. It copies 
the land, but then it's a land. It's not like a factory worker. So you can tap that straight away for mana. That's what we saw Thomas do here in, uh, in his previous turn, already in his next turn with the time walk. Tapping the ruby again. Let's see what he can do with it. Playing the rack. Not very effective yet. If he can find the chains and some kind of draw seven spell, it'll start working. There is a Black Lotus. Two cards in hand. What is he going to do? This is exciting. Just passing the turn though. Oh man. I mean, for some, I, I, for some reason, I'm rooting a little bit for Thomas here because he's just trying to do something different. Something that I haven't seen a lot. I also love the deck of Kun, by the way. You know, Juzam Jin. I mean, it's a beautiful creature to look at and to see it kind of crush enemies. You know, that's what it wants to do, what it's supposed to do. Talking about that, let's see if Kun is going to turn it sideways. I mean, it may not be the best option for him since Thomas can double block on the factories and then kill the Juzam. On the other hand, that is really risky for Thomas to do because Kun, of course, has that white package, right? He's got disenchants, he's got swords, so that would be quite risky. So he is going to attack. And now the question is, is he bluffing or not? And look at that, Thomas not even considering that double block. He's like, I'm not going to do it against a deck with disenchants and swords. I'm just going to take the damage. I'm on 15, I'm fine. I'm fine with that. And it makes sense because Kuhn's hand is also stacked, right? I mean, if Thomas would play with counter magic, then again, it's a different story. But I think in this scenario, I probably would have done the same. Anyway, uh, Kuhn here taking another damage. He's going to play something else out. Another Juzam! Oh! That is painful! Another Juzam hitting the board! This is not good here for Thomas Nelson. He's looking at 10 points of damage. Or perhaps he is, he's kind of forced to make that very risky double block next turn. Let's see what he can find. Needs to do something here. Maybe play a word of command again. That would be really sweet. Take over the hand of, uh, of Kun. So Kun, you're drawing card for turn. Four cards in hand, I believe. He can just attack for 10, exactly. And now we're going to see that risky double block, right? He's kind of forced into it. That's the thing when you're behind. You got to do things that you don't like. You got to take the risks and you got to hope for the best. Probably going to block. Exactly. Double block. Tap and pump. Because then you've got two, three, three factory workers blocking the Juzam. You deal six damage to the Juzam and you get five damage back. And that's enough to just kill one assembly worker. So, um, yeah, but look at this. Sword supply shares. And I think if you're Thomas Nilsson, you kind of know that this is going to happen. But again, you got to take the risk. So he gains three, then loses five. Actually, I guess he gains two because then in response to the pump, Kuhn is going to use the sword. So he only takes, uh, gains two, then takes five. So in total, he loses three lives. So he drops here to 12. Yeah, this is really tough now. Remember, this is game number three, so it looks like Kuhn is going to the finals unless a little miracle is going to happen. I mean, at least Thomas, after this, probably still has one turn. You know, he's on 12, so he's going to take a hit for 10, drop to 2. There's the attack. Two life remaining. What can he do? Are we going to see a pass or is Kuhn able to finish it already here this turn? I mean, he's so close to the finals now. Passing your turn. Come on, Thomas. Make it exciting for us. Come up with something. One creature isn't enough. Nope, that's it. Look at the hand. He didn't have what he needed. Kuhn here winning the semifinals and he will advance to the grand finale, the big finals of the Raging Bull series. Remember, we started with 76 players here at this old school magic tournament in Amsterdam. Only two remain. One of them is Kuhn. The other one will just have to wait and see. You will see that 
in uh, the next episode right here on Timmy Talks, talking about that. If you're not a subscriber yet, hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. And now that you've done that, I would also like to ask you to do, well, maybe you're already a subscriber, great. I would like to ask you to do three other things that are completely free, like, share, and comment on this video. All these things are completely free, like I said, and they help the channel move forward. Talking about moving forward, you can also become a patron of the channel, support the channel financially as well, help me to continue making this content. How does that work? Check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks for all the information. It's really easy and it already starts with $1. And for that $1 a month, you get some nice perks. You get access to the Timmy Talks Discord. You can play in the Timmy Talks online events, you know, the tournaments that I organize every couple of months. And your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every single video, including this one. Let's go to the end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Somebody can see.